Hello, draftsmen and dungeon delvers. My name is TB Skyne, and I like art quite a lot, actually. Kind of made a whole YouTube channel about it, which is somehow now my job. I've gushed extensively over classical art in a previous video about grief in art. I have spent, God, truly so many hours viscerally enjoying the art of animation, but today we're talking about League of Legends splash art, which... You know, on the surface, maybe that feels a little bit weird. Cosmetics from a multi-billion dollar free-to-play game, that doesn't exactly seem to be the place that you would go for art appreciation. But Riot Games, for all its many, 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 truly, God, truly so many, so many flaws, for all of that, nonetheless, Riot Games has had the good sense to hire extremely good artists, extremely skilled and extremely passionate artists to round out its art teams. And a benefit of that is that even though the cynical function of splash art is to be glorified advertisements for microtransactions, these artists inject their passion, their craft, and their attention to detail into the work anyway. And if you go looking, examining these artworks in detail, it can actually be really quite rewarding. So let's do that, shall we? This is the third episode of Beauty in Splash Art. The primary quality of this splash art is the strength of its storytelling for the character. In the Odyssey lore, Sona is a member of the Templar Order, a woman who is spiritually in touch with the golden substance known as the Aura, which is like the spice from Dune, but if it was an allegory for whale oil instead of cocaine. It's a magic substance, the galaxy runs on it, it probably has magic powers, you know the kind. The Aura has shown her visions of apocalyptic doom should Cain and Rast reach the legendary Aura Gate, and so she is on a vision quest to save the universe. And in the narrative of Odyssey, she's very much the straight man of the protagonists, the one somber, serious-minded, introspective, quiet character on a crew full of loud, cartoony weirdos. But I kind of didn't need to tell you all of that, did I? Because the splash art told you already. Her costume is this perfectly symmetrical, almost throne-like shell of curves and metal, with a halo around her head that, in combination with the heavy decorated hood and the streaming silk banners attached to her shoulders, immediately brings to mind the idea of a religious or spiritual monastic order of some kind, like she looks like a space priestess or a nun. Then there's the orb of Aura hovering amorphous before her, swirling and glowing with mystical power. And Sona's control over it is shown visually, and it looks practiced and effortless. A couple of hand poses, one tense and spread like the fingers of a puppet master, and one relaxed and gentle as though she's coaxing along a small animal. Her control over the substance is obvious, and the effortlessness comes from the fact that she isn't even looking at what she's doing. Her gaze is intensely fixed on us, the viewer. The splash art as a whole is technically a little bit of a loud light show, shimmering sashes, golden glowing aura, and an explosion of particles bursting out from behind the character, but the mood of the splash isn't chaotic, because all of that bursting golden light is being shaded by Sona herself, whose character is backlit and kind of dark right in the middle of it all. With her centered position in the splash art and the heavily symmetrical design, she becomes a visual anchor, a beacon of calm and control in the middle of what would otherwise be chaos. And again, this is storytelling. I think what's depicted in the background of her splash art here is an aura gate, possibly the legendary aura gate that her quest is about, which is a mystical portal to other dimensions that could bring destruction to the universe if it's misused. And here is Sona, literally standing between us and the chaos on the other side, a guardian and a bulwark, a beacon of peace and calm amid loud, bright disorder. And that is exactly her character. Even if you don't know the details of the lore, you can understand this about her just by looking at the splash. This splash art is a beautifully managed balance between visual noise and chaos and visual calm and control, all of it being used to tell the character's story. You see this picture, and even if you don't analyze it in prosaic terms like I've just done, emotionally, you understand something about who she is and how she acts in the world. And all storytelling aside, 
God, the colors are gorgeous here too. Look at the rendering on that orb of aura, the amber gradient from the core, which is almost black, out to a surface that is pockmarked with bubbles like the purest honey. And what a clever decision to have the orb be deformed here, not perfectly spherical, sci-fi-like and round, but warping, almost as though in response to Sona's gestures. This reinforces the idea that she has control over it, of course, but combined with the flowing bands of light swirling and wrapping around it, you also get a sense of motion and movement, a sense of the thick and portentous weight of this mystical substance. But you know as well as I do that the centerpiece of this splash art is the eyes. The principle is simple. Contrast enhances intensity. The difference between black and white is much more impactful and exciting than the difference between, you know, two shades of random gray. The backlight from the gate makes Sona the darkest part of the image, and then the hood on her head shadows her face even further, allowing her eyes to glow like fire, especially against the much colder light that illuminates the rest of her face. Everything else in this scene is bathed in gold and yellow, but her face has this cool, almost bluish or purple tone to it. That cool tone helps enhance the sense that her face is being shaded from the golden light. Shadows tend to be cooler than their surroundings, and once again, it creates a contrast against which her eyes and her gaze can stand out even more strongly. And it's a piercing gaze she's got. Her eyes aren't pinned open, she isn't rolling her eyelids back to stare at us like a horror monster, but they are open. No relaxed half-lid is softened in the expression. The full circle of her iris is visible, and her gaze is fixed directly on us, the viewer. And again, that's storytelling. Sona isn't concerned with looking at the aura she's controlling because she doesn't need to, and she isn't distracted for even a moment by the bright particle explosion happening behind her back because for her, it is no cause for concern. There is something ever so slightly uncanny about it, both her complete lack of reaction to her surroundings and the fixed stare of her eyes. It's the kind of confidence that you can only get from either total control or unshakable faith. If we look down the rest of the body, Sona is centered in the image, and her floating metal shells and her equipment are symmetrical in the composition. But her body is ever so slightly twisted, her shoulders are tilted, and her hand positions are obviously asymmetrical. But her face, her face is dead center on. Perfectly aligned, perfectly horizontal, almost a little bit mechanical. And again, this is contrast. The symmetrical stillness of that face commands attention. It stands out, draws your eyes to hers, and enhances that feeling of being fixed by a stare which is looking both at you and through you. And maybe that raises a question. The golden orange of her eyes, that's the same tone as the golden orange of the aura, right? And those streaks of gold under her eyes? I mean, sure, maybe that's just makeup or, or decoration, but... Don't they also look a little bit like maybe that is gold slowly oozing out from under her skin? So, is Sona controlling the aura? Or is the aura controlling her? Or perhaps it's meaningless to make the distinction. Perhaps at this point in the story, as Sona makes her stand as a bulwark before the legendary aura gate, she and the aura are one and the same. God, I miss Odyssey. Like, I, I don't want Riot to bring back the skin line just to shove six more champions in there that don't really fit. I just I just want to know what happens in the story. Give me give me an animated series or a webcomic. Or, like, if you hadn't shut down Riot Forge, you could have done, like, an FTL-style roguelike. That would have been good. Just, just, just give me some... Just do something with Odyssey, Riot. Please, you can't leave me hanging like this. In the first video in this, I guess, series, I talked about traditional Sejuani, which I would argue is one of the best storytelling splash arts in the entire game, because it portrays Sejuani in a very interesting way, vulnerable, unsure, and just a little soft. Victoria's Sejuani feels in many ways like a follow-up to that piece. Once again, the light is centering on her and her relationship with Bristle. Once again, tribesmen are on their knees offering her symbolically loaded objects, but the context of the situation could not be any more opposite. 
where traditional Sejuani portrays her in a moment of ambivalence and perhaps even dread at taking up the War Mother's mantle, Victorious places her squarely on the other side of those doubts. The title says it all. This is Sejuani Victorious, Queen of the Freljord, Sovereign of All She Sees. And as a viewer, you don't need to know anything about her character to understand that. It really is one of those cases where the compositional storytelling is so obvious, it feels almost silly to point it out. Like, why would I explain it? The image explains itself. And part of the reason why is that this is a gorgeous example of clear visual hierarchy. The first element of any image is light. If there is no light, then there is no image. And in painting, and in art in general, the light is the artist's first tool to direct attention and manipulate power. Now, it can go both ways. Light can be used to disempower as well as empower, but in this image, the light is power, and that which it falls on is powerful. So, almost all of the light falls on Sejuani. She is lit by this hazy column of pale winter sun from above, which glints off of her crown and her armor and her weapon, all the symbols of power and potency that she's clad in. And her face and shoulders are mantled with this bright white fur collar, like a lion's mane almost, which draws even more attention towards her face as the brightest area in the image. And speaking of the face, being lit from above and with her jaw inclined upwards so she doesn't stoop her head to acknowledge anyone else in the room, the light carves those perfect cheekbones out of her face, giving her an appearance almost like she's sculpted in stone, all geometric shapes and sharpness, all matriarchal authority. Sejuani is the gravity well of this image. Everything else is arranged relative to her, orbiting her and oriented by her. The second most powerful entity in the image is Bristle, her boar companion. He too is lit, but not as much and not as brightly as his queen, and Sejuani demonstrates her dominance over him with that dainty and delicate touch. A single finger brushing against his headpiece lets us know that she is in absolute control of what this terrifying beast does at all times, and like Sona with the aura, she doesn't even need to look at him to do it. And Bristle's posture, with his head inclined towards her to receive the touch, with his body protectively wrapped around her throne, confirms his loyalty. I don't need to explain to you their relationship. You can see that if anything here comes at Sejuani, it has to go through him first. Finally, below Sejuani, below Bristle, disempowered and meaningless, denied even the dignity of having a visible face, there kneel the tribesmen, offering their gifts. A bow to symbolize the defeat of Ash, and a gleaming shard of true ice to symbolize victory over Lysandra. These supplicants are in shadow and out of focus, barely more than distracting decorations begging for attention at Sejuani's feet. And of course, we are among them. The point of view of the camera is with them, with the crowd below Sejuani and looking up. And this is very basic visual language, of course. Looking up at someone or something from below makes it seem larger, more imposing, and generally more powerful. But I think it adds something that we aren't even in the front row here. We aren't the primary observers of the scene. We are just one more person in a crowd of subjects kneeling before the queen. You get all of that information, you understand all of these things instantly, just by glancing at the picture. The light and the composition establish an instant, legible hierarchy of subjects, and you don't need to know a word of the lore to understand it. Besides that, the rendering, the craft here, is really freaking gorgeous as well. The whole image is overlaid with a film grain filter, which is fairly common for splash arts that aren't trying to be particularly cartoony. It adds texture and washes out the contrasts ever so slightly, and subtly helps the image from feeling plastic or too smooth like cartoony art sometimes can. I love the rendering of the crystals in the crown a lot. The pale sunlight washes out the color, but you still sense the deep purple hue and the depth of the their color beneath that. There's a subtlety to the gradation of purples, which goes from rich and dark to almost pink, and there's a real sense of translucency in these gems, which is just really well painted. Also, the throne. Like, I really like the rendering on the throne. Because from a distance, it looks basically geometrically perfect, right? All straight lines and immaculate stonework, but zoom in close, and it becomes such a weathered, 
crafted object. You see how the lines are never quite perfectly straight, the thickness never quite perfectly consistent? There's chipping in the rock, and there's scratches and tarnishings, and all of these inconsistencies and imperfections gives it a real sense of being crafted stonework, something handmade by artisans, people working with a hammer and chisel rather than reproduced to perfection by a factory machine. And speaking of subtle texture work, by the way, look at Bristle's tusk here. Like, this would have been so very easy to just paint as basically a flat color with some shading on it, but good lord, you can see the veins in this thing, lines that like flow along the curve of the ivory. This is utterly invisible at any kind of reasonable resolution. Arguably, it's completely unnecessary, but the artist went the extra mile here. That goes for the rope on Setuani's flail too, by the way. Look at this. This is braided cord. And again, this just needed to be a rope or a chain or something, but not only did the artist take the time to render the complex pattern of a braided cord, they even painted the individual layers of the braid with edge highlights and shadows to give it full three-dimensionality. And this is what I was talking about in the intro to this video. This is a commemorative skin splash art that will only ever be shown to most people in, like, a phone screen size, and most players will probably never own it. But when artists are working from passion and craft, these are the kinds of rewards you get for paying attention to what they do. Jennifer Westling Velasco, and sorry if I mispronounced any of that, is a senior illustrator at Riot and a true veteran of the splash art game. And before we talk about Aurora, I do want to call out this woman's sheer goddamn range. She is responsible for the splash arts for, among others, Little Demon Tristana, Prestige Mythmaker Sivir, Pumpkinhead Fiddlesticks, Soul Fighter Samira, Seraphine, Workshop Nunu and Willemp, and Nightbringer Aphelios. She has a recognizable style for sure, but what a range of craft. Like, you can't do that if you are not dedicated to your work. Anyway, Aurora. Now, in anticipation of what people are probably already typing in the comments, Yes, the thigh bulge, the little pudge and squeeze where the thigh-high boots grip the flesh, the softness, the absolute territory. Yes, it is very attractive. I appreciate it as much as the next man. Please stop calling her thick because that's not what she is. And this is a video about sober-minded intellectual art appreciation. So set that horny nonsense aside and let us zoom in on the most important part of this splash art. The fur. The fur. It's the fur, you goddamn perverts. I'm talking about the fur. But okay, since you people clearly can't concentrate, we'll come back to it later. And we'll start instead with some of the other qualities in this splash art. For example, it takes place in a mostly white and gray landscape, very desaturated and neutral. And this is on purpose so that when Aurora's magic carves a window into the spirit realm, that magic has a neutral canvas on which to overlay its sudden influx of colors. The edges of the magic here are rendered gorgeously with chromatic aberration and color streaks on the boundaries. And here's a little bit of visual storytelling. As Aurora interacts with it, she herself becomes edged by those same color bands, visually showing her ability to interact with both realms at the same time. Look at Aurora's fingers delicately brushing against the boundary here. Look at those streaks of light and color. I also really like the subtle touch of having the lenses in Aurora's glasses streak purple from the reflected magic light, and I love the otherworldly glow from under the brim of her hat, which is rendered with these soft feather brush strokes curling around each other like threads in a canvas. Which brings us back to the fur. When viewed from a distance in a smaller resolution, Aurora doesn't look particularly furry. Like she has a fuzzy collar, furry ears, and obviously the big furry tail, but for all intents and purposes, she just kinda looks like a regular human girl, right? But then you zoom in and you see, oh, that's a lot of fuzz. Actually, that's a lot of little tufts of fur outlining the edges of her thighs, her shoulders, and even peach fuzz along her cheeks. It all helps Aurora look subtly soft, even from a far distance, and as you pay attention, you notice that it's not just the fur that's rendered this way. 
look at the knee socks here. Do you see those little minuscule, tiny strokes around the edges? Individual wool fibers painted one by one, so tiny that they're practically invisible, and yet, as you zoom out, they have the effect of subtly softening the edges of her knitted knee socks. Further up on the character, look at this soft and out-of-focus peach fuzz. It's all single-line strokes with a blur effect applied to them, I think, and that allows the edge lighting to almost glow as it refracts the magical purple light of the spirit realm and ever so gently outlines the volume of the cable knit beneath. Again, this is practically invisible at any lower resolution, but it adds subtle detail to the shape and the texture of the artwork. And this is everywhere in this splash art. Everywhere on Aurora, whether it's fur or wool, you find, first of all, this meticulous noodling of stray strands and fibers, but also this wonderful texture painting that gives you a real sense of the form and the structure of the fabrics. There is a wonderful tactility to this. You can see this image and you can just imagine how that would feel under your hands, rough and warm and just a little bit itchy the way that wool tends to be. If we turn our attention to her fur collar, look at the flow here. Look at the directionality and the volume created by those single strokes backed by texture painting and the surfaces that are carved out of it with light and color. And speaking of light, look at the glow on the edge of this collar. The sense that light is being caught and refracted and penetrating the fibers. There's a real sense of translucency here. The glow here is 100% pure white, and that gets to glow so brightly because everything else around it, the white fur, the winter landscape, everything else is less pure white than it is. The fur is textured with gray and blue and purple and just a little bit of pink, and so that glow gets to really shine. It's wonderful management of values and contrast. And this is not to take anything away from the bits of the art that aren't fuzzy and furry. Like, look at the color of her boots here. The artist carves these decorative lines across the bending surface of them, and with just a few streaks of reflection and light gives them volume and presence. This could very easily have looked like, you know, painted on decorations on the boots, but no, Westling takes the time to paint in shadows under the edges of the metal and highlights along its rim, and look how it creates volume and form. It almost lifts it up off of the boot itself. Aurora's splash art is one of the most wonderfully tactile splash arts in the game. Despite having a baseline cartoony aesthetic, so much of what's in here feels like it has such a sense of volume, such a sense of surface texture that I can imagine what it would feel like to touch or hold it. The weight, the pliability, the sense of the surface's resistance, it's all painted in here absolutely beautifully. It's almost kind of a pity that most people won't look at this any closer than what, like, their phone screen allows, or any bigger than the resolution displayed in the in-game League of Legends shop, because this is an artwork that really rewards you for zooming in and appreciating the work that is happening in the details. Before we get to the next splash art, this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Now, they've asked me to personalize this ad, make it fun, maybe do a little skit, but frankly, skits don't work on me. I've never been convinced by one. I just kind of want to know what the product does and why I might need it. So sorry, Surfshark, but I'm going to be a bit dry about this. I need a VPN for a number of reasons, but the main one is security. I'm not like a huge celebrity or whatever, but I've received harassment and negative attention enough in my time that a couple of extra layers of encryption and safety are necessary, and a VPN is part of that safety. What a VPN does is encrypt your connection and route it through the VPN servers, making you harder to track and your connection harder to interrupt or spy on. A VPN also helps protect you if you need to use public Wi-Fi, which is often very vulnerable to malicious actors, and Surfshark also offers ad blocking and malware protection, as well as extended services like antivirus and, probably the thing I find most useful, name and email protection. Basically, if you need to sign up for something on a website like one time, you know, the websites that annoyingly just insist you have to have a login in order to use them, Surfshark can generate you a virtual name and email so your real name and email won't be stolen in any data breaches or sold to data brokers, and you won't get spam or other nonsense for your trouble. A VPN also helps you watch things on streaming services not otherwise available in your country. I use 
his mind to watch Mythbusters, which is shockingly difficult to watch legally in Scandinavia, and it can help you circumvent certain kinds of media censorship, all of which is very useful. Surfshark does not collect your personal information. You can install it on an unlimited number of devices with one subscription. If you use my code, you get four additional months of Surfshark for free on top of an annual subscription, and if you try it and find that you don't like it, there is a 30-day money-back guarantee so you don't end up paying for a subscription that you're not going to use. A VPN is a good thing to have, and Surfshark does what you need a VPN to do. I am already quite fond of Star Guardian Zaya and Rakan, not the least because their initial splash art presents them as such a perfect set of Team Rocket antagonists to the Star Guardian heroes. Smug, confident, just a little bit sexual, and totally into it. It's a great attitude work. And oh hey, look, they're pulling that trick about putting glowing eyes in shadow again to intensify the expression. But it's also a thematic shadow, it's a shadow over their eyes because their perspective is quite literally dark. They are dark, corrupted guardians. So why then, in their redeemed artwork depicting the triumphant moment of their return to the light, does the shadow persist? The scene is full of light, of course, bursting brilliant cosmic lights shining from their embrace like a sun, but over their eyes and over their faces there's still just a bit of darkness. We'll get back to that. Zaya and Rakan are disgustingly in love with one another. They are the most in love that two people have ever been, and they are in love in that intense mutual obsession kind of way that almost borders on a form of cooperative narcissism. You know the kind, the people whose entire worlds revolve so much around one another that it's almost as though nothing else really exists to them. Now my wording here might sound a little bit negative, but believe me when I say I mean it with affection, because this sort of couple may be pretty annoying to deal with in your friend group, but in fiction, deep and unembarrassed mutual love is a fun and sometimes even a beautiful thing. And it's not an easy thing to depict well. The trouble with this kind of sentimental romance is that it's an eye-rolling cliché. It's the subject of hackneyed poetry, gas station greeting cards, and Valentine's Day commercials. It requires a level of attempted sincerity, which can very easily read as performative and shallow. So, how do you make it work? Well, to start with, kill the part of you that cringes. You cannot depict this kind of starry-eyed, hyper-romantic love without dipping into some form of cliché. So the game is to pick your clichés. For example, Zaya and Rakan both wear capes, so those two capes here are billowing and flowing together. The curve of one proceeds perfectly into the other, and in a very literal sense, they complete one another. And if you follow that visual flow through the composition, there's even the implication of an infinity symbol hidden here. So they complete each other, and the magnitude of their love is infinite. These are both cliches, eye-rolling cliches at that, but they are depicted with skill, and while not depicted subtly exactly, they are depicted in a way that complements the image rather than overwhelming it. As another example, take the posing here between the two of them. The cliché is the deep embrace. The cliché is two people practically wrapped around one another, clinging to each other as though they want to become one being. But what's captured here isn't quite that, it's the moment just before that. Zaya has her arm around his neck, her fingers in his hair, but Rakan isn't holding her yet. His hand is hovering over the small of her back, the other one brushing on the edge of her hip. In less than a second, he will grab her like a man grabs a life raft and eliminate every distance between them, but not just yet. The image lingers not on the moment of reunion, but the moment of anticipation of reunion. That split second before a climax where the rush of feeling is at its most powerful. And that's quite effective, I think, especially when it comes to conveying Rakan's emotions in the moment. As we talked about in the first Star Guardian Zaya and Rakan splash, the shadow over their faces codes for menace, for evil. It is a darkness from which a pair of villains glare condescendingly out at the world. On the redeemed splash, on the other hand, the shadow is a representation of intimacy. 
It is a private bit of darkness within which they stare, not at the world, but only at each other. It is the darkness of a stolen kiss at the back of a party. It's the darkness of two people together under the covers in bed. We talked about how light is used in painting, usually to designate a subject or lead the viewer's attention. Whatever the light falls on is what the artwork wants us to look at. So what's happening here is that the artwork is pointedly saying, don't look at this, don't put your attention here. That's what creates the sense of privacy. But the trick, of course, is that that just makes it more enticing to look by hiding their faces, one of the most important and eye-catching parts of a character design away in shadow, it is tempting us to look closer at them. And I really like the expressions here. It would have been easy and obvious just to match them, right? They're experiencing the same emotion, which is romantic love, so just make their expressions the same to show that. But no. Zaya's face is one of blissful absolute attention, a gentle little smile, absent any tension. Rakan, on the other hand, for him, it's almost something more like relief, isn't it? That downturned eyebrow, the grin that almost seems a little unsure, especially combined with the hovering hands that aren't quite holding her yet. If Zaya's expression says, I don't care about anything else in the world except you right now, then Rakan's expression is more like Thank God that you exist. Thank God that you are real. Thank God that you are here, that you are with me. It is the dumbfounded grin of a man who can't quite believe that he's managed to get this lucky. And there's lore reasons behind this too, of course. The story is that Rakan sacrifices himself to the darkness to restore Zaya to the light, and then Zaya goes on a romance quest to save him from the darkness. And this is the conclusion of that, hence the emotions. But my point is, even if you don't know the lore, it still works. You still get a sense of the swell of feeling between them. And look, sappy over sincere romance is a hit and miss kind of thing. And while I think this is a very well executed example of the form, if it doesn't hit for you, then none of this is interesting. So let's put the emotionality aside and just appreciate some craft. And let's start with glitter, because frankly, you can't have magical girls without it. Glitter is liberally applied to this image, from the starry sky to the texture of basically every other piece of fabric. But one thing I appreciate is, look at Saya's skirt, for example. It's not just that it glitters, but the particles of glitter are distributed carefully, concentrated around the areas of highlight, and used not just to look pretty, but to enhance the volume of the pleated full-figure folds. Similarly, looking at the torso of Rakan's suit, check out those subtle rainbow refractions happening here. Little streaks of blue and purple and pink, the telltale signs of holographic fabric. Again, it helps the sense of volume. Besides being pretty, it outlines the planes of how the fabric is folding around his body, just like it does over here, curving smoothly over Zaya's hip. And also, check out the detailing on Zaya's feathers. These are so lost in the shadow at the top of the screen that in a smaller resolution, you basically can't see them. But look at the way that they're layered. The artist fades them from a deep purple to something more like a hazy teal from front to back, creating depth and form that helps the gesture of the twist of Zaya's head, that slight tilt she has relative to the point of view. Speaking of which, by the way, look at the glitter on Zaya's face here in the lipstick and around her eyes. This is another detail that's functionally invisible at normal resolution, but seeing it up close, it adds a lot of nice visual texture that I think works really well with a Star Guardian character design besides looking quite pretty. My criticism, though, is that surely of the two of them, Rakan is the one who should have more sparkle. And makeup, for that matter. Like, you cannot tell me that this man wouldn't rock a smoky eye decorated with glitter at the first given opportunity. And being a Star Guardian, surely that should be part of the uniform. The Empyrean skin line has a somewhat weird and convoluted storyline, especially for a skin line that's expressed visually mostly as people in black raincoats throwing bright colors around like it's a Kingdom Hearts themed acid rave. It involves multiverses, dimension travel, and epic conflicts to preserve the balance of the timeline of the alternate dimension multiverse, which is why Pike is fighting Jax while trying to kill an alternate reality board gamer version of himself. 
The relevant bit of all of this nonsense is that Empyreans are people born from shattered and collapsed dimensions. They are rootless, unmoored, and alone, fundamentally disassociated from their home reality. Now, where basically every other Empyrean splash art does, you know, the classical splash art thing, showing the character in a badass power pose, using their badass powers, Vex's splash art takes a remarkably different and even slightly disturbing tone. At the center is Vex, and the plumes of Empyrean flame from her ears and Shadow's claws all create lines of convergence that point to her sitting on Shadow's palms. So that's all very well structured and quite classical, but the rest of the scene is utter chaos. We have this pillar of stone in the background, which curves away both at the top and at the bottom, as though it's being viewed through a lens with extreme pincushion distortion, or perhaps as though it's folding in on itself, Inception style. The rest of the background is this smear of indistinct gray and white shapes tinged with chromatic aberration and streaked with particles as though it's blasting past at supersonic speeds. Here, around the edges, there's a wobble like a heat haze, and the scene is blurred, but it's blurred inconsistently. It's not blurred like a camera lens would blur something, or even like the focus of the human eye would. It blurs and sharpens almost seemingly at random. Vex's sleeves are perfectly in focus, but at the end around the flame, they blur. Her hood is perfectly crisp on the left, but blurred on the right. Her coat is in focus, except around the Empyrean insignia on her chest, and Shadow is alternately in and out of focus, with smearing and motion blur on his face. The feeling this creates is instability. It's not an action scene, and we aren't working with a tilted, dramatic Dutch angle, but everything feels like it's moving, rushing, warping, twisting. It has the sense of being almost at the eye of a hurricane, with a whole world being torn apart around it. And look at Vex's gesture here. Again, every single other Empyrean art features empowered, badass poses, characters basically standing there for the shot for their movie poster, but what is Vex doing here? She's sitting on Shadow's hands, slumped back against the distorting rock pillar, and what, looking at us? Is she looking at us? With the mask, you can't tell. It has an expression on it, but it's kind of inscrutable. We have these long, slit-like eyes cut through from below by these long streaks, almost like tears flowing down her face. And certainly the mouth shape is downturned, but is that a sad expression, or just tired? Maybe she's napping? Maybe she's dead? Vex slumped over, utterly impassive, contrasts with the whirling chaos of everything else that's happening, and that creates ambiguity. It creates narrative interest. Beside her, shimmering like mirages, are these odd mirror images of her face, as though she's phasing through multiple versions of herself, or as though we can see her simultaneously from multiple angles. The vibe of the image is like a fever dream, or maybe a nightmare. And this, I think, is much better storytelling for the Empyrean concept than basically any of the other splash arts in the line. This splash art communicates the unreality, the bizarreness of the premise of the Empyrean story, and presents a compelling vision of just how uncanny and strange it must be to flit between dimensions, to pass through realities that are falling apart, to be unconstrained by linear time. Rather than present the Empyrean concept in the visual language of superheroes and anime protagonists, rather than the visual language of a power fantasy, it presents it as something that feels a lot more like a kind of cosmic, psychedelic horror. Now, besides all of that, the color work on this splash art is so good. Empyrean splash arts are generally pretty good looking. The artists really get to play with bright neon glow and heavy contrasts. And the decision here to pair Vex's screaming neon yellows and greens with this utterly colorless gray wasteland, that really works for me. It makes them even louder and more searing to look at to the point of almost being kind of unpleasant. 
Check out the liquid boundary between these bright red pinks and oranges and the neon yellow on Vex's ears. That's a really cool effect. And look at that rippling texture of concentric circles on Shadow's hands, like the banding of an oil slick in water. Not to mention the fingerprint patterns on Vex's soles that are kind of weird and uncanny. And finally, check the f*** out of the way that her sleeves are rendered. Those bright highlights that run along the edge define the volume of them in such a way that you get a sense of almost alien skin texture in the leather, deep ridges and folds that look really gnarly, like imagine what those must feel like to touch. Ugh. Imperian Vex is not, I think, a particularly great or terrible skin, but I adore the creativity of its splash art. This is a commercial piece of art meant to sell an entirely commercial product, and chaos, ambiguity, weirdness, and visual mess aren't really the usual themes that these kinds of things go with. Again, look at the other Empyrean splash arts. The visual language for selling cosmetics tend to favor power fantasies, understandably. This artwork swings a little bit for the fences, though. It's trying something different, a little bit out there, a little bit weird, and I really appreciate that. I have a couple of criticisms of this splash art, primarily related to the posing. Most of it is really good. I really like the twist in her torso, presenting that magic crystal in her hands forward. There's a good dynamism to that, but I'm not 100% a fan of the way that she's holding her weapon here. The arm is completely straight, and it just kind of looks stiff. It doesn't really flow with anything else she's doing. Worse, though, I think, is what is happening with the pose from the hips down. Because her torso is twisted to the right, it is pointing off to one side, but her hips look like they are pointed dead straight ahead right into the camera. Now, that's not to say that it's an anatomical mistake, I just don't think that it reads very well. The sense I get is that you have all of this twisting, whirling dynamism up top, and then her hips and legs are just a static, flat surface pointed right ahead towards the camera, and I just don't really think that works. Now, the hips aren't really important to the image, or even to the main thrust of the pose, so this wouldn't be a problem, except the splash art keeps calling attention to it by literally highlighting it with light. The glow from beneath is visually a really cool idea in this splash art. It plays beautifully with a lot of the things that the splash art is doing, but I also think it's a distraction calling attention to the wrong parts of the artwork. To demonstrate, let's first take the color away so that we're only working with contrast, black and white. Here's the original, and then here is a really quick dirty edit that is brightening up the top of the image while darkening the bottom. Now, this isn't meant to be a fix to the splash art because like, the values are all blown out here. There's a lot about this image that looks worse, but I'm just trying to demonstrate an effect here. By shifting the brightness away from the bottom towards the top of the image, that becomes the draw of attention. And I think it should be because up here is where this splash art becomes amazing. Before we get to that, though, I just want to go over some gorgeous details. First of all, the glittery texture work on the trail that comes out of Diana's coat, like, that's very Frozen, it's very Elsa, but it's also just freaking gorgeous. Like, it really does look like thin sheets of ice folding over on themselves. On the blade over here, do you see the way that that magic effect almost smolders on the edge of the metal, that golden rim? It's almost like a kind of tarnish that then smoothly transitions into blue and pink and purple, leaving this trail that looks like nebulae and star fields. It's gorgeous. Moving on to Diana's arm, do you see that grainy texture that's overlaid on it? Combined with the ice crystal tattoo, which, by the way, check out the crystallized grainy brushwork on that, that's great. You get a sense that Diana's skin itself is ever so subtly frosted, speckled with ice crystals, which I think is just really clever texture work. There's also a ton of absolutely beautiful engravings painted onto her metal armor. Look at these swooping, swirling, curving designs like stylized frosting on a window. And like like, god damn, what a gorgeous piece of metal painting work here. The glow and the reflections and the shine is fantastic. Moving to the top of the image, Diana's floating crown is a wonderful little bit of painting. Those flares of red and purple and pink placed along the metal are such a good way to make it reflect the aurora and the light show all around it. It's really pretty. But the highlight, the showpiece, the big deal, the reason this splash art is on my list 
is the face. Well, okay, first let me give a shout out to the hair, which is not only used really nicely to frame the face, which is important, but look at those billowing voluminous curls and twists. It's doing the anime thing where Diana's rising magical power is making her hair rise into the air, and it's really effective at that. It gives you a sense of something powerful happening in the scene, even if she isn't like action posing or somersaulting or whatever. Check out the purple accents on the end of the hair also, and the way that the stars shine in and shine through it. You almost get a sense that her hair trails into the sky to become a part of the stars. That's really cool. But the face. God, I love the face. Faces in League of Legends, especially female faces, have a tendency to be very smooth faces. They tend to be rather stylized and flattened. They don't tend to redden or sweat or glisten. They don't tend to have pores or wrinkles or visible imperfections or skin folds for that matter. Now, sometimes that's fine. Sometimes that's what a given character design or splash art calls for. But at worst, it can make characters look plastic and kind of bloodless, like anime figurines rather than people with a physical presence. Winter-blessed Diana has presence. Look how her nostrils are just a little bit asymmetrical and uneven, imperfect. Look at the folding of skin around her eyes, especially here on the right where the tattoo over her eye is mildly distorted by a fold in her face. Look at her Cupid's bow and the way that the divot from the nose to the lips is like carved, and it too is uneven, ever so slightly imperfect. Diana's skin has a few spots on it. It has the implication of texture, the implication of just a bit of sweat or wetness. You can see the volume and the roundness of her eyeballs, how they bulge out ever so slightly, how the eyelids fold over and around the volume of them, how they're compressed a little bit by their own weight. Compare and contrast with, say, Coven Nami, which is a gorgeous splash art in its own right, and there are some narrative reasons why Nami might look like this, but you see the difference, right? The difference in volume, texture, and character, how one looks like the face of a person, and the other like the face of a doll. And again, this isn't about one is good and one is bad, just that they are very different vibes. And at least for me, when you've got Diana playing a character like a Northern Lights goddess, the gravitas that comes from this kind of rendering and painting is a huge benefit to the impact of the image. I also personally just like this kind of face a lot more. I think it has more personality, more uniqueness. It feels more like you could learn something about the life of the person being depicted by observing closely in the details, and you know, obviously that appeals pretty specifically to me. To finish out, let's talk about a splash art which I don't actually like that much. This is Porcelain Irelia by Alci Lau, a younger artist who was hired on as a full-time artist at Riot after working as an illustration intern, and this is her first full-scale splash art for a skin. Now, my dislike of this splash art is primarily that I don't think this looks like Irelia almost at all, and I have a serious annoyance with the porcelain skin line in general, and skin lines like it, that they often don't seem to care all that much about the champions that they are applied to. Porcelain Misfortune is a damp, wet nothing of a skin, and Porcelain Darius looks absolutely horrible, chunkily dressed up in a ceramic substance whose purpose is to be dainty, fragile, and pretty, completely at odds with everything else about him. Similarly, Porcelain Aurelia doesn't seem to be wearing the costume because anyone had any good or interesting ideas to express through her, but because the porcelain skin line is filler to pad out someone's My Shop offerings or shove into random capsule drops. Now, them's the breaks of capitalism, of course, nothing new under the sun there, but it annoys me because this skin line does have potential, and I wish that that mattered. Porcelain Aurelia does not look like Irelia. At least, not Irelia as we know her in the main League of Legends splash art, or indeed in her in-game model. Like, these are not the same person, they simply aren't. But Elsie Lau did use an in-game Irelia model as reference for this splash art, the Wild Rift version, which is notably different from how she looks in almost any other League of Legends media. And looking at Lau's studies, yeah, no, the resemblance is on point, actually. She captured this version of Irelia quite well. 
See, because the problem here isn't that Lao did a bad job capturing Aurelia's likeness. She didn't. The problem is that Riot is doing a bad job deciding what Aurelia's likeness even is. Wild Rift Irelia was changed, apparently to make her prettier, I guess, to align her more closely with some sort of beauty ideal, and in so doing, she lost a lot of the unique features that make her distinct in other League of Legends media. The downstream consequence of that is that in the Porcelain Irelia splash, she's completely unrecognizable as herself. But what sucks about this splash art is not really Lao's work. What sucks about this splash art is Riot's artistic fecklessness. This is something that should have been addressed by management, by design leads, whose job it is to ensure consistency across the product. This didn't get caught because I guess Riot Games Incorporated doesn't really give a sh** about the porcelain skin line. It's just supposed to be shop filler. Alcy Lau is a highly skilled, technically accomplished artist who has, in the time that she's been working at Riot, demonstrated some real range. She's responsible for Spirit Blossom Master Yi, for example, which is a fantastic showcase for achieving depth and contrast and visual drama with a very limited color palette. She also did Mythmaker Sivir, where she does some genuine hey! magic with these papercraft bunny figures. Like, look at how she constructs their volume, giving them depth and three-dimensionality, despite being made of flat paper. It's very skillful work. And although I don't like the porcelain Irelia splash, Lao's skill is on display here. Irelia's blade, for example, zoom in and check out the absolutely gorgeous detail work here. The engravings in the gold have shape and volume and flow, and that bright orange highlight is beautifully chosen with a very pretty color bleed. The intricate detailing on the porcelain blades is used really well to describe the volume of the object, especially on the hook over here, and those liquid swirls and eddies in the blue porcelain paint running up the blade are gorgeous as hell. And look at the fabric of Aurelia's dress. Do you see those flower decorations impressed into the fabric, painted subtly into the material? There's some careful choices being made here about when and how to highlight the rim of those impressions to give them volume, and it works really well. And the hair, like, come on, look at the frickin' hair. Lao paints the hell out of the light and shadow here, playing this brilliant bright backlight off against purple, blue, and gray shadows in a way that creates layers and layers of depth. And like, if you don't think that this is pretty, I don't know what to tell you. As a final thing, look in the corner down here at this slithering strand of magic. Lysandra controls the serpent porcelain spirit, and it seems to be here, snaking its way up behind the little ram figure, subtly adding a little bit of peril to the scene, implying that danger is sneaking up on our hero. And look at how that magic is rendered. Look at the liquid prominence curving up and back away from it, the edge light on the form of it, those subtle little surface details. Look how it weaves through the highlights and the shadow. All of these beautiful details, like the other details in the splash arts we have discussed in this video, are the product of craft. Craft which has been learned, practiced, and applied by working human artists. And I bring that up because a response that I have seen annoyingly often to this splash art and other splash arts that people just happen not to like is, This looks like AI art. And no, the f it doesn't. The work of Elsie Lau does not look like AI art. AI art is a form of plagiarism which is desperately trying to look like the work of Elsie Lau. That is the whole purpose of generative art. It is an algorithm that has been fed billions of pieces of high-quality artwork created by artists just like her in order to copy it badly so 14 Silicon Valley startup dip can scam another billion dollars out of the tech sector. When you look at a piece of art you don't like and try to insult it by calling it AI art, all that you're doing is announcing to company executives, grifters, and scam artists that you can't tell the difference, which means they can fool you. The core of that insult is generative AI can create work that is just as good as this, and that is exactly what the slimy tech assholes who are trying to sell generative AI art want to hear. You are making their pitch for them. You're telling them that they are right, that their technology works the way that they say it does. You are drinking their f***ing Kool-Aid. Because no, generative AI f cannot 
create this. Generative AI does not understand light or color theory or texture. It does not understand painting or volume or composition, and it certainly doesn't understand storytelling. All that AI art can do is regurgitate a statistical average of whatever stolen data it already has, a half-assed imitation of patterns without any understanding of why those patterns exist. I don't like the porcelain Aurelia splash art very much. I think that the pose is kind of weak. I think it looks strange to have Aurelia twist her hips so far leftwards and curve her back so far backwards, and then crane her neck and look down the way she does. I think the composition feels a little bit lopsided, as the highly rendered blades on the right, along with the tea set and the snake, leaves the left side of the image feeling rather empty, and so the splash art feels unbalanced to me. But what I'm criticizing when I say that are decisions made by a human artist. An artist whose technical skill, by the way, outstrips mine and the skill of 99.9% .9 of everyone who will ever watch this video by literal orders of magnitude. An artist who is this freaking good at such a young age and who clearly takes her craft seriously. An artist whose work I am interested in following because if this is how good she is now, imagine what she can do in 10 years. The only way that anyone can call the work of Al C. Lau AI art is by not actually paying any real attention when they look at it. And if you can't be bothered to pay attention to what you're looking at, then you don't get to talk shit about it. I am begging you, all of you, to stop helping the generative AI scammers. Stop throwing the insult around. Stop calling any random thing that you don't like AI art just because it feels a little off. You are doing their advertising for them. Besides which, that is an incredibly cruel thing to do to an artist whose only crime is that her work is so good that generative AI is trying to rip it off. <sighs> anyway, this was supposed to be the final review of the video, but I don't want to end on such an angry note, so let's take a second to appreciate something wonderful. Not only is Toy Terra Chogath his best skin, no contest, no challengers, it's not even close. Not only is it his best skin, the splash art is just a delight. And the big thing here, at least I think so, is texture. In this skin, Chogath is a big soft dinosaur plush with grabber arms strapped onto him and oh my god. God has Fortune K gone all in on selling that exact specific vibe. Look how soft he is. Look at all this fussy felt roughness, but also at the careful softness with which things like his teeth are rendered. They are tooth shaped, but so soft and so harmless they look like pillows, like the mouth of a hand puppet. Look around the rim on the button on his nose. Do you see those tiny little scribbles of felt texturing? Do you see the stitches carefully drawn to be just a little bit uneven and the shadows around the holes in the felt fully selling that soft squishy surface with the stuffing pushing out on the skin? It's it's really good. The fluff escaping from his belly is also fun because it's mostly just an amorphous white cloud with some careful lighting applied, but it's edged with these feathery, pixel-thin tangled brush strokes showing individual fibers in the cotton. It's a level of detail that's almost invisible at normal resolution, but up close, it really adds to the sense of texture and volume and dimensionality of the cotton. Also, check out the texturing on these straps, by the way. Like, not only does that look perfectly like that exact kind of fabric strap, I don't know what that kind of fabric is called, tell me in the comments, but you know the kind. It also looks kind of worn, like not fresh from the factory, but something that's been used and stretched and folded and burnished, and that adds a nice bit of character to the accessory. It also, you know, matches Cho'Gath. He has those splits in his seams and the big patch on his belly, and that's one of the charming things about him as a character design. This is a toy that's clearly been played with. He has been hugged enough to break and loved enough to fix. And that's a video. Oh my god. One of the things that makes it hard to just quit Riot's products entirely with all of the dumb stuff that they've done is... God damn it, they do hire some good-ass goddamn artists. Uh, this script actually was uh, originally three splash arts longer than the one you're getting here, but I had to cut them for time because it was getting kind of out of my control. The runtime is already way too long. 
That does mean, of course, that I could probably find enough material for at least one more of these videos if anyone wants to see it. So, you know, if you do, subscribe and leave comments down below and maybe share this video with people who you think might like it. It all helps with the uh, numbers. Yay. And, you know, if you want to play an engagement game, tell me which splash arts uh, you think might be a good fit for this kind of video. Like, what splash art have you seen that, like, struck you as like, oh, this is not just an advertisement for, like, uh, cosmetic. This is like, oh, this is like a piece of art that, that, that does something to me. That would be lovely to know. That would be helpful. Uh, so tell me that in the comments if you want. Since this video is sponsored, I won't be doing the usual Patreon self-promotion thing, but if you have a spare dollar or two this month, consider putting them towards Doctors Without Borders or the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. Even a small donation can do a lot of good with those organizations, and, well, that's where I'll be putting half of the sponsorship money as well. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Remember to be kind to each other, stand in solidarity with those who struggle, and may the tides of history wash gently over us all. Thank you.